Uh, I want to take a minute uh, before I start to thank JPS and IPS for organizing the panel, and of course to George for uh, asking me to participate. So this talk, as George mentioned, is taken from a much larger paper that will hopefully be published in the future. Uh, a bit of a work in progress. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the terrible attacks on Gaza this week and to recognize the sacrifice and suffering of those who have been killed and been displaced, including uh, this morning the entire family that was killed in the airstrike and couldn't send small children. Uh, I should also state at the outset that the opinions expressed are my own and do not represent those of any organization or institution I'm affiliated with. So in 1974, the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, was recognized by the United Nations and the Arab League as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. The ensuing 38 years witnessed hard fought attempts by the organization and its leadership to protect this designation from internal and external foes and competitors. Indeed, the phrase sole legitimate representative became a shield and a cudgel. As a national liberation movement, the PLO defended its position by claiming that it was essential for the sole representative to speak with one voice. When the Palestinian Authority, or PA, was created in 1994, the rationale for one voice was transformed into the imperative that there could only be one authority, first in Gaza and then the West Bank. Thus, any attempts to critique the leadership of the PLO or the PA invariably led to the accusatory questions, who are you? Who are you, they would demand, to speak? Who are you to question? And who are you to criticize? The, person, the purpose of these questions was clear, to silence, to intimidate, and to set the limits and parameters of permissible discussion and dissent. As one former member of the Palestinian Legislative Council explained, the Palestinian leadership, in particular Yasser Arafat, confused revolutionary legitimacy with constitutional legitimacy, invoking one or the other according to the circumstances, and sometimes playing one off against the other. Therefore, by defining and shaping who and what represented the Palestinians on the world stage and locally, the Palestinian leadership deliberately limited their accountability to their people, with devastating consequences that are still being felt today. Now, since the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993 and implemented a year later, the PLO has existed in name only, which begs the question, who represents the Palestinians today? This question of representation is particularly pressing due to several different trends in recent initiatives. First are the Arab revolutions and counter-revolutions past two years, which have witnessed challenges to and the overthrow of several of the region's leading and long-standing dictatorships. Meanwhile, Palestinians have been largely sidelined from the so-called Arab Spring. Second is the attempt by the leadership of the PA, as George mentioned, for the second year in a row to obtain full membership for the state of Palestine in the United Nations, with uncertain implications for the Palestinians in the diaspora, as well as those still living under occupation. And finally, is a recent initiative for direct elections to the Palestinian National Council, the PNC. Now, in this talk, in the article it's drawn from, I examine the failure of the Palestinian National Movement to develop independent institutions and representative bodies. I argue that the PLO and its associated bodies not only belong to a different era, but are incompatible with the current reality of life for Palestinians inside and outside of historic Palestine. They're also incompatible with regional and global movements for representation, transparency, accountability, and democracy. In addition, I contend that what remains of the PLO lacks credibility and is so utterly compromised that any attempts to restore it or its key bodies will not result in unifying or revitalizing the national movement, but will serve to entrench factional differences and award a corrupt, incompetent, and illegal leadership with legitimacy and outlines. Thus, I assert that the PLO and its related institutions are irredeemable, and a new path of representation and unity must be found. I am aware that this is a charged and emotional issue. As the Palestinian struggle continues, the Palestinians remain under occupation and exile, the Gaza is under attack, and many still have sympathy for, if not allegiance to the PLO, or at least the idea of it. I have no illusions that what I suggest will be easy, or that many will agree with my assessment at this time. However, I believe that if Palestinians are to achieve their goals, and develop a strategy for how to do so, it must begin with a frank and honest assessment of past failures and successes. 
I should also state at the outset that in the past I've written about restoring the PLO as a way to unify the Palestinians. However, in the ensuing years, and as this paper will argue, I no longer believe that to be the case. Moreover, as a historian, I've been troubled by a trend that has emerged with some discussions of the history of the Palestinian national movement, have replaced fact with myth, sentiment for analysis, and rhetoric for reality. I will begin first with the failure of the Palestinian national movement to develop representative bodies and independent institutions. Among the documents leaked to Al Jazeera as part of the Palestine Papers was one prepared by a legal researcher for the PA on the distinction between the PLO's different institutions. The document stated that the PNC, the Palestinian National Council, is, quote, the highest authority of the PLO. It was created to, quote, serve as the parliament for all Palestinians inside and outside of the occupied Palestinian territory, including Jerusalem. And its responsibilities include for formulating the organization's policies, plans, and programs. The same document states that the executive committee of the PLO is the primary executive organ of the organization and represents it at the international level. While this may be the function of these two bodies on paper, in reality, these descriptions serve to overstate the role of the PNC and understate that of the executive committee. Over the past four decades, it is the executive committee of the PLO which has essentially performed the organization's legislative and executive functions. Indeed, this role became more pronounced over time. In contrast, the PNC did not check, balance, or even advise the executive committee, but merely served to affirm its decisions. Moreover, the executive committee, much like the PLO and the broader national movement, increasingly became beholden to and relied upon the often uncontested decisions and actions of Yasser Arafat. And since Arafat's death, Mahmoud Abbas has sought to fill this role. Nor has the PNC's ineffectiveness been a mystery to Palestinian commentators and former leaders. For example, Shafiq al writes that from 1968 to 1991, the PNC never voted to elect the position of president of the council. In 1991, an election was finally held, and it was at Arafat's suggestion not due to the demands of the PNC members. Predictably, Arafat's choice won by an overwhelming margin. Indeed, Ahmoud's recollections correspond with criticisms of the PA by Palestinian scholars. For example, Jim al argues that even before the Oslo agreements were signed, a fundamental reform was needed of PLO institutions, in particular, the PNC. And he writes that in spite of the central role assigned to the PNC, that its sessions were largely both formalistic and ceremonial in nature. And this was due, he adds, to the fact that its activities were limited to an annual or biennial gathering of Palestinians appointed from the diaspora, whose function was to provide legitimacy to political deals reached by the leaderships of the various resistance organizations. So, while there may have been vigorous debates between the different political groups represented in the PNC, it would be difficult, if not disingenuous, to call it a legislative body. It is this link between the composition of the PNC and the leading Palestinian political organizations that is revealing about the limits of the council. All seats on the PNC were appointed. They were not elected. Moreover, the vast majority of seats were awarded based on the PLO's quota system of representation and distributed in proportion to the size of a particular political faction. The bigger you were, the more seats you got. However, Asadganim states that the quota system was exploited by Arafat to, quote, guarantee passage of the decisions he supported and the selection of his confidants to important posts. And while the PNC had seats for independents and members at large, those independents appointed to the PNC were largely aligned with FEDEC, further bolstering its weight within the PLO and enhancing Arafat's power. This structure served to reinforce three dynamics. First, PLO decision-making remained with the executive committee, where the leadership of the different political organizations had seats and which met frequently, unlike the PNC. In addition, it was the executive committee and not the PNC which controlled the PLO's budget. Over time, decision-making within the executive committee and budgetary control were consolidated under Arafat. Indeed, budgetary control would be used to influence decision-making, which would also be a feature of Arafat's rule in the Palestinian Authority. Second, the leadership of the different organizations selected the members of the PNC. Therefore, the members were beholden not to a constituency, 
but to their organizations, and in particular, the leadership of those organizations. The final trend was the predominance of FETA and Arafat within the PLO, which over time became virtually and deliberately indistinguishable from each other and the national movement as a whole. The PNC's ineffectiveness was even worse during the Oslo period. With Arafat's power unchecked and the PLO effectively dissolved, the PNC became a symbolic rubber stamp. This was on full display in December 1998, when uh, the December 1998 PNC meeting held in Gaza. As the New York Times explained, the events of the day in Gaza were pre-programmed, and there was no surprise when the PNC and other Palestinian leaders raised their hands in support of Mr. Arafat's decision to amend the Palestine National. So once again, several issues emerge. The decision on the charter was made by Arafat, and the vote by the PNC complied. In addition, exactly who comprised the PNC at the 1998 session is unclear, as members and non-members were present and voted. Moreover, members who had previously resigned their seats, like Edward Said, were invited to attend. Therefore, the limited effectiveness of the PNC before and after Oslo raises questions about the potential for reform of such a body. While the composition, representation, and bylaws may have been justifiable for the parliament in exile of a national liberation movement, the same cannot be said today. In addition, the PNC has, been, has historically been far weaker than the executive committee. Moreover, for the past 20 years, the executive committee has been comprised of individuals selected initially by Arafat and then Abbas, and has been utterly beholden to both of them. Therefore, reforms to the PNC alone will not change or alter this dynamic. Nor is it clear how a PNC, even one that is directly elected, as some are now advocating for, can hope to limit, constrain, or even influence an executive committee that maintains authority over the budget, as well as domestic and foreign policies. Moreover, an example of an elected but toothless body already exists in the form of the Palestinian Legislative Council, or PLC. From 1996 to 2006, the PLC represented Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Fiscal and political authority, however, rested not with the legislature, but with the president. As president of the PA, Arafat managed the PLC much as he did the PLO and the PNC. Indeed, when the PLC attempted to behave independently, Arafat either ignored the body's decisions or used the power of the presidency and the dual title and position of chairman of the PLO's executive committee to undermine or override those decisions. In addition, the PLC's functions and authority are limited by the terms of the Oslo Accords, which also serve to expand the powers of the presidency. Not only is the PLC subject to the Oslo agreements, its authority is confined to areas under PA jurisdiction, which is consistently being limited. Meanwhile, the, PL, the Oslo II agreement, which was done for the West Bank, also gave the president of the PA executive and legislative powers. These legislative powers include the ability to introduce legislation and promulgate laws passed by the PLC, as well as to issue secondary legislation and regulations. <coughs> Most importantly, it allows the president to issue decrees without the input or oversight of the legislative or judicial branches. In short, the president of the PA is a power unto himself, except, of course, for Israel and the United States. Therefore, there are significant institutional and legal limitations that hinder or prevent substantive reforms to the PLO, the PA, the PNC, and the PLC. The barrier to entry to any attempt to revitalize these institutions will be the leadership of the PA, as well as the United States and Israel. This was evidenced in the 2006 PLC elections, in which Hamas's victory in the ballot box was blocked by these very same forces. Even after a unity government was declared, elected legislators to the PLC were consistently prevented from taking their seats. This includes an active campaign by Israel to jail PLC members in the West Bank and prevent those in Gaza from traveling to the Wallah for meetings. In 2009, nearly a third of all Palestinian legislators were held in Israeli detention, and 13 are still being held today. In addition, the PLC has not convened in over five years. What do 
these experiences indicate about the likelihood that the council could be restored through direct elections. As I discussed above, the 1998, in 1998, the PNC only met with the acquiescence of Israel and the United States, and then only to affirm a decision already made by Ottawa. Even in the unlikely event that efforts to revitalize the PNC are successful, what would it mean in practice? As experience of the PLC indicates, at best, a directly elected PNC would still be beholden to the Executive Committee for its budget and to Israel and the United States for permission to even meet. The legacy of failure of the Palestinian leadership and lack of institutional development can be seen most directly in the current state and stagnation of Palestinian politics. Indeed, the current political landscape represents yet another structural limitation to the fore. Not only do attempts to revive the PNC through direct elections ignore or downplay the issues I previously described, they also overlook a major contradiction. Namely, democratic elections, which serve to enshrine the rule of non-democratic movements, will bring neither reform nor democracy, and will only serve to entrench the status quo. It is important to note that Fatah, which has dominated Palestinian politics since the late 1960s and maintained a virtual monopoly on the political and economic spheres over the past two decades, has repeatedly demonstrated that it has no interest in representative and participatory governments. This reality overrides the all too infrequent Fetha conferences, which are invariably held by supporters as a sign that reformers will emerge to reclaim the movement and restore its perceived moral glory. Of course, these hopes only result in disappointment when the same discredited leadership is maintained. This is precisely what happened at FETA's sixth Congress in 2009. FETA is supposed to hold elections to its Central Committee every four years. Yet the 2009 conference was only its sixth meeting and the first of 20 years. Held under the watchful eye of the U.S. finance trained and armed Praetorian Guard, the Congress witnessed the reemergence of the notorious Muhammad Dahlan, who has since fallen from favor. Now, as if this was not enough to demonstrate how far Fetha is from reform, the notoriously corrupt Ahmed Qurayya, who was not voted onto the Central Committee, was able to obtain a seat through backroom deals and the intervention of Abbas and other key allies. This is hardly a promising trend for Palestinian democracy and reform. Moreover, it can be expected that an unreformed Fetha party, whose representatives maintain a large bloc within an elected body, and are beholden to an unrepresentative, corrupt, and ineffectual leadership, will not be the vehicle for reviving the national movement, but a persistent impediment. The other major winner, of course, for an election in an election would be Hamas. Elected on a platform of reform and change, Hamas has brought neither. Instead, it has emulated Fetha's, Fetha's role with even more conservative policies. Like Fetha, it has also demonstrated a penchant for, tor for targeting, jailing, torturing, and killing its political opponents and critics in Gaza. The organization has also adopted a number of repressive actions, including blocking the internet, execution of suspected collaborators, and restrictions on the press and public, and public assembly. Indeed, Palestinians in the West Bank of Gaza, who have attempted to conduct peaceful assemblies and protests, have been subjected to violent suppression by security forces of the respective truncheon authorities in Ramallah and Gaza. Moreover, the multiple agreements and initiatives to resolve the impasse between Fatah and Hamas, negotiated since 2007, but never implemented, should make it abundantly clear that these parties are not interested in power sharing, their only concern is acquiring and maintaining power. The other major Palestinian organizations, Popular Front and the Democratic Front for Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP and the FLP, hardly offer hope for an alternative. As demonstrated by the recent municipal elections in the occupied West Bank, the stature and influence of the Palestinian left has arguably never been lower. Although Fetha was split and Hamas did not participate in the election, Neither the PFLP nor the DFLP received a significant number of, a vote, number of votes, even with a depressed turnout. Thus, without a significant improvement in organizing, fundraising, and outreach, it is highly unlikely that the Palestinian left would be able to revive their more of status in the event of participatory elections. Instead, much as they experienced in the PLO under Arafat, particularly in the Oslo period, the Palestinian left's that desperation for relevance will be used to further the agendas of stronger parties whose positions and platforms are antithetical to their own 
In short, they will be sidelined even further and made even more irrelevant. What should be clear from this discussion is that the state of Palestinian politics remains bleak. And none of the existing political factions offers a compelling vision for the future. In part, it's because they do not have it, and because they do not represent the future of the Palestinians, but their past. Indeed, a revitalization of the Palestinian national movement will not be driven by these groups. It is far more likely that they will seek to delay and hinder its development. Rather, it will, it will require a different way of thinking about what a national liberation movement looks like in the 21st century. If a new iteration of the national movement has any hope of succeeding where previous attempts have failed, it must be truly representative, and it will require abandoning the previous structures and organizations, including the PLO and its key bodies. There are those who will argue that the PLO remains the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. I respectfully disagree. And I would ask instead, what kind of representative abandons the very people it purports to represent? What kind of representative has a leadership beholden not to its own people, but to the very powers responsible for their continued dispossession? What kind of representative repeatedly concedes the basic rights of its people, attacking those who object, while the leadership and the oligarchy surrounding it benefit from their positions, titles, privileges, and the state of perpetual occupation? These questions and answers to them clearly demonstrate how far the PLO is today from what many Palestinians believe it to be at its level. They also reveal that what remains of the organization is so completely and thoroughly integrated that it cannot and will not lead to representation, accountability, or democracy, but to stagnation, internal conflict, continued dispossession, and defeat. There are those who will contend that revitalizing the PNC through direct elections offers a path to reform the PLO and unify the national movement. Again, I respectfully disagree. I would add that the individuals and organizations sponsoring this initiative have overlooked the very serious and dangerous institutional limitations that hinder not only reform, but any attempt to change the status quo. While I agree that Palestinians should have a say and a vote on their future, what exactly is it that they are being asked to vote for? And to that end, I pose a number of questions, which I believe must be answered. It is not enough to suggest that these questions will be resolved in time, but first there must be elections, or at the very least voter registration leading to elections, or to fall back on vac vacuous slogans, or appeals to sentimentality. And they include, how will a revitalized PNC, even one that is democratically elected, overcome the political and institutional limitations historically placed in the body? What measures are being taken to ensure that a new PNC will not be subject to external manipulation by the United States, Israel, and its Arab allies? or internal manipulation by the PA's leadership. What evidence is there to demonstrate that a new PNC and a new PLO will be any more responsive to Palestinians around the world than the original PLO or the PA? How does an initiative which hopes to challenge, if not replace, the, Pal the current Palestinian leadership rely upon its offices and representatives for voter registration and eventually elections? After elections, where will the PLC PNC convene? Where will its budget come from? Who will be responsible for managing it? How often will it even meet? As these questions make clear, while the idea of PNC elections sound well-meaning, there's a great deal of uncertainty about their implications and the impact on Palestinian rights. In short, elections are not a panacea. Indeed, if history is any guide, these elections are as likely, if not more so, to further entrench factional differences while offering legitimacy to a leadership which no longer enjoys it. The history of the Palestinian National Movement, however, offers a different lesson and a possible alternative path. Prior to 1967, the PLO was seen as a tool of the Arab regimes, in particular Jamal al Nasser's Egypt, and was dominated by the old liberal Palestinian families who were seen as responsible for the Nakba due to their political infighting. However, the different fledgling political groups who advocated for armed struggle, Fatah, and the Arab Nationalist Movement, which later became the PFLP, were seen by many, particularly Palestinian youth, as far more independent and legitimate. This increased after the victory of the Battle of Karama. And within a year, the Palestinian political groups forced out the PLO's existing leadership and took over the organization. Now, although this historical analogy is not, per is not perfect, it is suggestive. If Palestinians want a representative body, national unity, an end to factional differences, and to replace a corrupt and illegitimate leadership, open letters, online petitions, 
Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, and polite requests will not be sufficient. They will need to build that movement themselves from scratch, and they will, they will need to make the previous body and its leaders, regardless of their revolutionary origins and rhetoric, titles, symbolism, and emotional ties, obsolete and irrelevant. As I have demonstrated, a fundamental change is required if Palestinians are to abandon past failures and create a different future. And a very different future is essential. While in some ways the Palestinian struggle has become more difficult, in other ways it has also become easier. Thanks in part to the overt racism, arrogance, and brutality of Israel and its supporters. However, those opposed to Palestinian rights should not be discounted or underestimated. They are large, powerful, well-placed, well-funded, strategic in their outlook, efficient, and flexible with the ability and means to draw upon a broad array of resources, and they are absolutely ruthless in pursuit of their goals. Therefore, the same sporadic individuals, organizations, rhetoric, and strategy will not succeed against such an opponent, and it is folly to believe so. In conclusion, without a new and very different national movement, Palestinians will continue observing anniversaries of the Nakba and every other tragic event that has befallen our people with little hope of finding a successful strategy for being able to achieve our rights. Thank you.